Welcome to EPG Path Shala. I am Ashutosh Kumar. I am a professor of political science in Punjab University. I also happen to be the principal coordinator of EPG Path Shala in the subject of political science. This paper, as I said, this is a paper of Indian Politics 2, and the title of the module is the reorganization of the states, region, religion, language, and culture. In this module, we discuss about how the demand for the reorganization of the state has come and how it has got a kind of colonial origin. We know that colonial India was divided into two different parts politically. One third of India belonged to the princely states. There were more than 560 princely states. On the other hand, the rest of the India was under the direct British rule and it was divided into the provinces. But the British, when they demarcated the provinces, they did not take into consideration the language or the cultural factors. So the Congress party, which was the leading party, which was leading the anti-colonial struggle, the nationalist struggle, as early as in 1905, recognized this and reorganized the provincial units of the Congress party on the linguistic basis. And then in 1920, in the Nagpur session, the Congress party passed a resolution that the provinces should be reorganized on the language basis. This demand was reiterated in 1928 in the Motilal Nehru report committee report also. And then in the Karachi resolution also, in the, from time to time, the Congress party committed itself to the reorganization of the states on the linguistic basis. Ironically, when the India became independent and when the Congress party became the dominant party in the constituent assembly, there was a rethinking about it. The, the Dar committee which was constituted for this purpose and consequently we had another committee, the JVP committee which was like Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel and Patabi, Patabi Sitaramaya, they were the three members of that committee. These two committees, they did not recommend the reorganization of the states on the linguistic basis. The common apprehension now was that in the, uh, in the aftermath of partition, the reorganization of the states on the linguistic basis or on cultural basis would lead to the rise of regional chauvinism. chauvinism. It, would, it would weaken the national unity, national integration. So the, the, the leaders like Jawaharlal and Nehru was of the opinion that on the one hand India was facing the, integration, the issue of integration of the princely states. On the other hand, if Indian government would go for the reorganization of the states, it would further weaken the sense of unity and the nation building and the state building which was being attempted by the Congress party. So ultimately we know that the Congress party was not in favor. But in 1953, when there was a civil war like situation after Ramalu uh, uh, died because of the fasting, so Andhra Pradesh had to be created in 1953. And once Andhra was created and Andhra became Andhra Pradesh when Telangana was integrated into Andhra, then uh, there was a kind of a other demands which had to be addressed. And that's why in 1955, the State Reorganization Commission, headed by Justice Fazal Ali, was constituted. And then the, the, the process started of the reorganization of the states. And ultimately, we know that the Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, at that time it was known as a state of Madras, was reorganized, Andhra Pradesh was created, then Maharashtra was created, and there were some um, debate about the creation of Maharashtra as well as uh, the, uh, the reorganization of Punjab, because Punjabi Subha demand was considered as a communal demand. So ultimately, we, in this module, when we read this module, we all are going to go through the three phases of the reorganization of the states. In the first phase, as we would see, the states were reorganized on the linguistic basis, cultural basis, and many states came up purely on the basis of language. And there were certain criteria which were used, and those demands were not accepted, which were considered communal demand or potentially divisive demands. So there was always an apprehension about the demands coming up from the borderland regions. In the second phase, what happens that the union territories like Goa, union territories like Nefa, which is now Arunachal Pradesh, they were given the constituent state uh, status, cons a status of a constituent state, uh, states of India. So many uh, union territories became full-fledged constituent states of India. That was the second phase. And the tribal states were also created, Meghalaya was created, so Assam was the also reorganized and many uh, new uh, tribal states, Meghalaya, Tripura, and then uh, you had this Manipur, they all were created. Uh, and then in the third phase, which starts from 
2000 with the creation of the three new states jharkhand uttar uttaranchal now it is uttaranchal uttarakhand and then chatisgarh they were created and then finally in 2014 telangana was created so we in this model we are going to go through the three phases of the reorganization of the states in the first phase the reorganization took place on the linguistic basis cultural basis in the second phase the ethnicity was taken into consideration tribal states were created and some union territories were simply upgraded himachal pradesh would be another example into full statehood and in the third phase which has started in the last 20 30 years now the demands are not coming up only for the linguist on the basis of the linguistic basis there is a shift and now the demands are coming up on the basis of greater development greater democratization and administrative efficiency in fact lal krishna adwani who was the home minister at the time of the creation of these three new states argued in the parliament that this would lead to a greater administrative efficiency so in this model we would see that this has been a natural process given the diversity and given the rise of the territorial identity region becoming the basis of the identity formation politicization of identity mobilization of identity now there are many regions in india sub regions the historical cultural regions which are becoming political regions and from these sub regions demand for separate statehood is coming up in a big way and in this model we are going to discuss this challenge this issue which is confronting the indian politics the reorganization of the states on the basis of language a process that began with the formation of andhra pradesh in 1953 and in a sense concluded with the tripartite division of punjab in 1966 did not only alter the internal geographical boundaries of india but also altered the established structure and patterns of politics at the sub national level the provincial boundaries inherited by an independent and partitioned india in 1947 were largely a legacy of colonial rule the provincial boundaries during british rule were largely a consequence of the manner and the sequence in which the east india company acquired or conquered territories later administrative convenience of the colonial rulers was the prime factor governing these boundaries territories were transferred from one province to another as on a largely ad hoc basis as a consequence in the early 20th century a majority of the british indian provinces were multilingual the population of both the bombay presidency and the madras presidency consisted of four major linguistic groups the bengal presidency the central provinces and punjab two were linguistically diverse just like other parts of india only the united provinces the uttar pradesh of today could be reasonably described as being linguistically homogeneous in the sense that it was a hindi speaking province the uniformity of the administrative apparatus and the use of english as a common medium of higher education under british rule fostered the development of a sense of a common indian identity however concurrently the use of indian languages in primary and secondary education the introduction of these languages as a separate area of study in the universities the development of the newspaper and publishing industries as well as the spread of the printing press beyond the large urban centers all these factors helped to sharpen the sense of regional identities which in turn were largely constructed around the regional languages with the colonial rule came employment opportunities and the development of new professions like that of the lawyers as education spread through a wide cross section of indian society competition sharpened among various social groups to derive benefits from the opportunities being offered by the raj in multilingual provinces this competition became one between the various linguistic groups if some groups believed that the others were monopolizing the resources being made available by the colonial state and hence stepped up demands for a large share others who had not been the first to have access to these same resources south to retain their dominant positions the first demands for separate administrative units on linguistic lines came from eastern and southern india demands were made in the early years of the 20th century for bihar to be separated from the huger province of bengal the bihar had been administered from calcutta 
now Kolkata, since the mid 18th century after it had passed under the control of the East India Company. There was an element of resentment against the dominance of public life and the professions in Bihar by individuals who came from Bengali background. Demands also arose for a separate province of Orissa, largely on similar lines. These demands received a fillip with the creation of a separate province of Bihar and Orissa in 1912 with the annulment of the partition of Bengal. In the Madras presidency, demands were made for separate province for the Telugu speakers which was to be named Andhra. This demand also was actuated by feelings that the Telugu speakers were losing out to the Tamil speakers and hence a separate province was a necessity. The Indian National Congress, while promoting national unity and thus by extension depreciating claims for separate provinces, however, did realize by the first two decades of the 20th century to concede the strength that lay behind these demands. As a result, initially Bihar and then later Andhra and Sindh were accorded the status of separate provincial units as far as the Congress organization was concerned. But the nationalist elites were not unanimous on this count. A resolution introduced in the Viceroy Legislative Council in 1918 was defeated with the stalwarts like Surendranath Banerjee, Tej Bahadur Sapru and M.A. Jinnah ranged against it. The opponents believed, including Muhammad Ali Jinnah, they believed that this would divert attention from the forthcoming constitutional reforms which they believed was the more important question to be taken up. The position of the British rule Raj was on the other hand ambivalent. Report on Indian constitutional reforms or the Montague James Ford report supported the idea of reorganization of provinces on the basis of language since that would make the resultant administrative units more compact and homogeneous and thus easy to govern. It also pointed out that such reorganization would enable the local administration to be carried out in the local language and further draw into politics individuals not familiar with English. However, the report left it to the provincial government to test public opinion before any such reorganization was seriously considered. By 1920, the Congress moved the state ahead on this issue. It decided to restructure its organization structure on the basis of language which increased the number of provincial Congress units. However, by establishing separate Congress organizations for the city of Bombay and the rest of the Marathi speaking areas of the Bombay province, it did sow the seeds of a future problem. Furthermore, the principle of language was not consistently followed. In the Marathi speaking areas of the central provinces and Birar, two separate Congress provincial organizations were created reportedly to accommodate the political ambitions of the regional leadership. Later in 1928, the All Parties Conferences Report, known as Nehru Report, appointed to draft a constitution for future free India, also recommended the reorganization of provinces on linguistic lines, though it refrained from making definitive statement in almost all cases. It argued that such reorganization would be conducive to the rapid progress of uh, colonial India as well as when India would become independent, it would also help in nation building. One of the first concrete moves towards using language as a basis for redrawing provincial boundaries came with the Government of India Act 1935. It separated Sindh from the Bombay Presidency and Orissa from Bombay to form separate provinces. The separation of Sindh, a Muslim majority region in Hindu majority Bombay, had more to do with communal considerations though language was one of the relevant factors. The formation of Orissa was, however, primarily governed by linguistic considerations. The Congress during this period continued to support the demand for linguistic provinces. Resolutions were passed in some provincial assemblies where the Congress enjoyed a majority, asking for the creation of new provinces. Yet, not all Congress leaders were convinced of wisdom of such demands. Even Mahatma Gandhi, under whose leadership, the Congress had restructured its provincial organizations on the basis of language, urged caution. His cautiousness on the issue increased as time went by. On the other hand, provincial leaders also made efforts to create an enmity among the themselves on the issues. The leaders from the coastal Andhra and the Ral Sima region signed an agreement known as the Sri Bad 
pact in 1937 which promised balanced regional development in any future Andhra province. With independence came partition. On the eve of the achievement of freedom and also immediately after it, there were renewed demands for linguistic states. However, on the backdrop of the partition of the country, the national leadership was not naturally concerned about the vociferous uh, tendencies which uh, came up in India and there was always a threat to the national unity and integrity. It was believed that linguistic states could pose a danger to the unity of the newly independent country by increasing regional identities at the expense of an overarching national identity. However, insistent demand for the formation of linguistic states continued which were not only supported by leading intellectuals and uh, uh, the literature, literary persons, intellectuals, uh, the journalists from various linguistic groups but also by several congress leaders who came from these uh, linguistic regions. Attempts were once made to arrive at a consensus within particular linguistic groups and reassure those who felt that they might lose out in a linguistic state since they belong to a backward area. The Akola Pact signed between the Marathi speaking leaders and leading public figures belonging to the Bombay province and the central province and Berar in 1947 was one such attempt. The National Congress leadership was disinclined to concede these demands and hence resorted to stalling tactics. A three member linguistic province commission was appointed by the Constituent Assembly under the chairmanship of Justice S. K. Dar, a retired High Court judge, to inquire into these demands. It was asked to consider the issue of the formation of linguist states in southern India and thus consider demands for the formation of Andhra, Karnataka, Kerala, and Maharashtra. The Commission, in its report, while acknowledging the strength of the demands, argued that this could pose a danger to the growth of nationalism and hence rejected them. Perhaps the Commission took a cue from the <coughs> unspoken positions of the central leadership of the Congress. However, the resultant protest from within the Congress against the Dar Commission's report forced its national leadership to resort to even more disparate major attempts at buying time. A three-member committee was appointed by the party. The members of the committee were such that it would certainly force any average Congress think at least 10 times before even considering uh, opposing its recommendations. It consisted of Dr. Patavi Sitaramaya, the Congress President, the then Congress President Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the Prime Minister, and also Sadar Vallabhai Patel, the Deputy Prime Minister, and who was the strong organizational leader. The committee popularly referred to as the JVP Committee reiterated the overall approach adopted by the Dal Commission. It considered the strength of the demands of linguistic states but argued that the fulfillment of these demands should await opportune time. However, the committee further noted if these demands had strong public support, it would agree to them. Meanwhile, by 1950, the process of integration of the princely states in the, into independent India was over. This, however, further complicated the linguistic scene. Some former princely states retained their separate existence or found themselves clubbed together to form distinct units. This meant that the, some linguistic groups found themselves divided among separate states, while some states like Hyderabad retained their multilinguistic character. The proponents of linguistic states proposed that these states be formed on the basis of the principle of one language, one state. This meant that each linguistic group was to have only one state for itself, thus making it linguistically homogeneous. Many arguments advanced in support of these demands. Linguistic homogeneity would naturally entail that the local language would be the official language of any given province. The local language would obviously bring the administration closer to the people, thus facilitating accountability. It was further argued that the linguistic states would be more or democratic for they would be small in size and the multilingual colonial province and hence would draw in more and more sections of the society into political activity. The widespread use of the local language in administration and education would naturally also contribute to the further cultural development of the relevant linguistic groups. It was further argued that the homogeneity would also assist in economic development and that it would enable the people to develop emotional attachment and loyalty to the provincial government. Linguistic states were also demanded as a matter of right. This was based on the assumption that linguistic groups in India had a distinct identity that had continuously existed over centuries. It was further argued that these groups were nationalities, if not separate nations, and hence had a right to separate province within India. 
But more importantly, rivalries between the competing industry groups were the driving force behind these demands. Those who had been compelled to live together due to historical factors no longer wished to do so. The Maharashtrians believed that the Gujaratis dominated the larger Bombay province and deprived them of their fair share of economic resources and hence wanted a separate state of Maharashtra. The Marathi speakers of the central province had lost their leading position in politics and were being rapidly overtaken by the Hindi speakers and hence wanted a division of the province. But they were apprehensive of being dominated by the Marathi speaker from the Bombay province in any future state of Maharashtra and hence desired a separate state of Vidarbha. One of the important reasons for the demand for a separate Andhra state was that the Telugu speakers simply did not want to live with the Tamil speakers in a large Madras province which existed since colonial days. But like the national leadership of the Congress, Ambedkar also was concerned about the divisive potential of such demands, but at the same time he considered their merits. He agreed that the arguments that reorganization on the basis of language would create linguistically homogeneous provinces which in turn would prove conducive to development and strengthen democracy. Dr. Ambedkar also warned that the continuation of multilingual states would encourage linguistic rivalries which could prove fatal for the unity of Indian Federation. Dr. Ambedkar also put forth a number of suggestions to counter what he believed to be the danger of linguistic states. He was apprehensive that the numerically strong community in any given linguistic homogeneous state would monopolize positions of power. Hence, he suggested a form of proportional representation to safeguard the rights of the linguistic minority. He also suggested the principle of one state, one language as an alternative to that of one language, one state. According to Ambedkar's scheme, while each state was to be linguistically homogeneous, each linguistic group, however, was to be divided across two or more states. The delaying tactics adopted by the central leadership, as we saw in the case of Dark Commission recommendation and JVP Commission recommendation, uh, it satisfied no one. However, it was the Telugu speakers who really took the issue in their hands and uh, there was a massive protest demanding for a separate Andhra state. What is Sri Ramalu, a respected freedom fighter from Andhra region, went on a fast unto death in support of the demand for a separate Andhra in late 1952. The central government chose to ignore the fast with the result that Sri Ramalu lost his life. His death is part of widespread violence which forced the central government uh, to capitulate and announce the formation of a new state of Andhra Pradesh. The new state formed in 1953 consisted of the Telugu speaking areas of the old multilingual Madras state. In doing so, the principle of one state, one language was followed since for the Telugu speaking areas of Hyderabad was not included in the new state. Andhra Pradesh thus became the first state to be explicitly established on linguistic lines in the post-independent era. The formation of Andhra Pradesh renewed demands for linguistic states in other parts of the country as well. The central government in response appointed a three-member states reorganization commission in 1953 headed by Justice Justice Fazal Ali with Sadar K.M. Panikar and uh, Pandit Hridayanath Kunjuru as the other members to comprehensively examine the issue of reorganization of the states in India. The commission extensively toured the country, met scores of individuals and received thousands of memoranda and finally reported in 1954 five making its recommendation public. The commission while generally adhering to the principle of one language one state in southern India rejected the demands for Maharashtra and Punjab. In the case of the former it recommended that the Marathi speaking areas of Bombay and Hyderabad be combined along with the Gujarati speaking areas of the former and the states of Saurashtra itself formed by merging the princely states of Kathiawar and Kutch region to form a larger bilingual Bombay state. The Marathi speaking areas of Madhya Pradesh should form a separate state of Vidarbha in deference to regional feeling. In the case of Punjab, the, the commission recommended that the state be expanded by merging Himachal Pradesh as well as the Patiala and East Punjab states union Pepsu into that one to create a larger Punjab uh, state. The report claimed that the demand for a Punjabi speaking state lacked substantial popular demand support and argued that the creation of such a state would not lead to would lead to increased communal hatred and would not really encourage communal harmony, hence rejected the demand for a separate Punjabi Suba. 
In the case of other states, it recommended minor territorial readjustment to prevent a particular linguistic groups that dominated a given area from becoming a linguistic minority. However, some similar demands like that of the exclusion of the Belarus uh, district and some adjacent areas in the state of Karnataka were rejected. The issue lingers on even today with the Maharashtrian dominated areas demanding that they be merged into Maharashtra. The rejection of the demand for Maharashtra was solely motivated by the concerns over the future of the city of Bombay, the industrial and financial capital of the country. The capitalist class of Bombay was largely Gujarati, while the working class and the middle class was largely Maharashtrian. So that the Marathi speakers formed a bare majority in the city, while the Gujarati speakers came a near second. So that's why there was a problem in the case of Bombay. The commission rejected the demand for Maharashtra. That rejection is part of a storm of protest in Maharashtra region, especially in the Marathi-speaking areas of the Bombay state. The central government's ham-handed and inept handling combined with the Bombay government's heavy-handed handling of the situation inflamed public opinion. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the Prime Minister, in an attempt to douse public anger, announced the three-state formula by which Bombay would form a city-state, while Maharashtra and Gujarat would be separate states. This further outraged Maharashtrian sentiments and sparked off the popular movement for the formation of a unified state of Maharashtra that was to consist of all the Marathi-speaking areas in India. Once again, it was Bombay which was at state. At that time, Moraji Desai was the chief minister and also the home minister in the eyes of the Maharashtrian because he was a Gujarati, so there was a violent protest against his leadership. The metropolis had long provided employment opportunities for both the Marathi-speaking middle class and the working class, and that's why Bombay was a bone of contention as far as the formation of the Maharashtra was concerned. The opposition parties in Marathi-speaking areas of Bombay, Hyderabad, and Madhya Pradesh directed the public anger against the Congress, which was seen as the party bent on separating Bombay from its natural Marathi-speaking hinterland. The Congress party, especially in the Marathi-speaking areas of Bombay, was on the defensive. Its leaders were confused as to their next course of actions. Siding with public opinion would have meant defying the decision of the central leadership. While supporting the latter's decision, the central leadership decision would have meant courting unpopularity. They chose to remain loyal to the party, almost all the non-Congress parties, ranging from the CPI, the PSP, and the Janssen and the Hindu Mahasabha, along with leading non-party public figures, formed an electoral alliance named the Sanyukt Maharashtra Samiti. In the general elections of 1957, the Samiti inflicted a severe defeat on the Congress, both in the Lok Sabha and the State Assembly elections, particularly in Western Maharashtra. The non-Congress parties displayed a rare sense of unity by putting forth a single candidate to oppose the Congress in most constituency. The Congress could form a government in the state thanks to its successes in Vidarma and Gujarat. Soon the Congress leadership realized after persuasion by the, con the state leaders that maintaining the bilingual Bombay state would entail a certain defeat in the next general elections. Finally, the state was divided on linguistic lines into Gujarat and Maharashtra in 1960. Bombay became the capital of the letter. As far as the demand for a Punjabi Subha on the eve of the independence with the imminent partition of Pan India on religious lines, strong demands were made for an independent Sikh majority country to consist of the central regions of the undivided British Indian province of the Punjab. However, neither the departing British nor the Congress that was to inherit political power from the former as far as the rest of India was concerned was were inclined to concede this demand. Both were concerned to prevent any further division of the subcontinent. After independence, the demand for an independent country died down. It now took the form of one for a separate Punjabi Subha within Indian Union. Though the demand was being caused in terms of language, it was in reality one which asked for a state where the Sikh community would form a majority and thus occupy a significant position in politics. The second aspect was reinforced by the fact that the demand was vociferously pressed forward by the Khali Dal, the political vehicle of the Sikh community. The linguistic reorganization of the states in 1956 ironically gave a flip to the, this demand for it not only rejected it but also added the predominantly non-Sikh areas and non-Punjabi of Himachal Pradesh to create a large state of Punjab. 
The merger of my PEPSU, where the Sikh community was numerically largest one, did not ease the concern of the Sikh leaders, who were apprehensive that it would be difficult to maintain the religious and linguistic identity in the new state. In the early 1960s, there were demands for a division of Punjab to form new states of Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. These demands were, however, dampened by a political settlement among the Hindu and Sikh leaders of the Congress, which sought to diffuse the concerns of the two communities. With the demand for a Punjabi Subha, many issues came to the fore. One of them was whether Punjabi was a distinct language or merely a dialect of Hindi. The other was whether Punjabi was only the language of the Sikh who wanted a Punjabi Subha or also of the Hindus who did not really want separate Punjabi Subha because they feared Sikh domination. The concerns of the Hindus led to a concerted movement among the community on the eve of the 1961 census to have Hindi instead of Punjabi declared as their mother tongue. This it was thought would lead to an increase in the proportion of the Hindi speakers in Punjab, reducing the Punjabi speakers to a bare majority even in the areas demanded for the Subha, for, thus undermining the, the demand. The demand became even more strident in late 1965 with Master Tarasin and Sant Fateh Singh taking the lead. The 1965 war with Pakistan led to the issue being sidelined, but the central leadership realized the dangers of letting such a sensitive issue smaller in a strategically crucial border state like Punjab. Similarly, the Sikh leadership too started to emphasize the linguistic aspect of their demand and de-emphasizing the religious angle. It has been argued that in, it was this shift of focus that finally led the central government in 1966 to trifurcate Punjab to form Punjab, a Punjabi speaking state with the Sikh community forming a single majority. Then Haryana was also created, a Hindi speaking Hindu majority state and Himachal Pradesh consisting mainly of the hilly areas that had been uh, merged into Punjab in 1956. However, this did not resolve all the issues. The new city of Chandigarh was created in 1950s to serve as the capital of undivided state of Punjab with the state's trifurcation, both Punjab and Haryana state claim to the city. So, very of favoring any of the two states, the central government devised a seemingly bizarre but typically Indian formula to deal with the naughty question of Chandigarh, which uh, while does not satisfy any one, prevents the state uh, issue from flaring up. Chandigarh is a union territory with the governor of Punjab as its administrator and serves as the capital of the states of both Punjab and Haryana. Let us summarize this module. As you went through the content of this module, you saw that we talked about the three phases of the reorganization of the states and what was more important was that since last two decades there has been this demand for separate state and these demands are coming from different parts of India. You have a demand for a separate state of Dorkha land. You have a demand for separate state of Bodo land. You also have a demand for separate state of Bundel Khand, which will be consisting of the territory of UP as well as Madhya Pradesh. Likewise, you also have a demand for Vidarbha, which is a very old demand, which has been simmering for quite some time. And then you have a demand for Maru Pradesh in, in Rajasthan and also the demand for Todagu state in the state of Karnataka. So there are many areas in India where you have demands coming up for the separate statehood. What does it tell us? It tells us that the federal promise of equitable development all over India has failed. So most of the demands which have come up, they have come up from the marginal areas. Take the example of Telangana. The coastal Andhra was developing much more than Telangana, whereas Telangana was mineral rich and Telangana people were saying that our river water is being exploited by the coastal Andhra people and we are not getting even drinking water. So this kind of the, 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 the complaint about discrimination, regional discrimination and under-representation of a particular region has given birth to the demand and these demands are on the basis of greater administrative efficiency greater democracy and decentralization of political power. So can we say that small is beautiful? Can we say that smaller states are going to do better than their bigger states? Or can we say that uh, it's a good idea to bifurcate or trifurcate the states? In some cases, it may have some logic. Like for example, you take Uttar Pradesh, which is too big to administer effectively. So there can be a ground of 
uh, dividing Uttar Pradesh into different regions. But at the same time, we should understand that there are there is so much diversity in India, and there are so many regions and sub-regions. So if you go on creating new states, India might up uh, might end up with many more than 50 states, as later Shuddin Khan had once predicted. So how many states we can create? And even if you create a new state, what is the guarantee that every community would get the equal rights? Because every every new state there would be a community which would be in minority. For example, you create Bodo land, then Bodo's uh, Bodo community may be in majority. What about non-Bodos? Likewise, you create Gorkha land. What about the Bengalis living in Gorkha land? Nepalis would become the majority. So there would be always this problem of majority and minority given the diversity, extreme level of diversity in India. So it is better to think about it. And I would also suggest in this module, we have suggested also that we cannot take up these demands on the basis of political opportunism or electoral calculation. There should be some common ground on which some demands can be accepted and other demands may not be accepted. So let's have a second re or a state reorganization commission. Let there should be a common parameter and let's have a popular demand because we know that when the states were created in the 1950s, late 50s, on the recommendation of this first state reorganization commission, there were certain criteria which were adopted. For example, the demand should not be communal, demand should not be secessionist, demand should be a popular demand, and the newly created state should be socially and economically viable. So like, right now, what, what we are seeing is that many smaller states, especially the northeastern states, are dependent on the center for the economic grants. So this does not make sense. We need to have a economically and socially viable states. So uh, we can understand that the smaller states like Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, they have done very well. But on the other hand, we have the example of Chhattisgarh also, where the Naxal violence has been going on. So smaller states may not take up the challenge to the territorial integrity and all. So these factors also we should take into consideration when we decide about the issues. So in this module, we discussed about the reorganization of the states and the issues which are connected with it. And we also finally come to this conclusion that, of course, these demands have to be met, but the, there can be certain ways to meet the demands. The only way is not to create a separate state. We can also look for asymmetrical federal features, which are already there in the Article 371 of the Indian Constitution. We can also provide some kind of autonomy, and there should be an attempt to develop all over India the, the original federal promise of having equal, equitable development so that we don't have a rich region and poor region, rich state and poor state, or we cannot have uh, internal colonialism anywhere in India. That would be the lasting solution to this demand for new states, smaller states in India today.